This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. So today on the show, I have Dave Stendhal, and uh, I think I've asked this to Dave before, but he probably doesn't recall. But just for some background, Dave's written three books. He, I, I think, is going to best describe himself as a, a, a system guru. He is, he is right in the – and has been there forever, whether it's uh, uh, conceptualizing and thinking up uh, systematic uh, approaches to trading the markets – uh, working on the coding side, developing products. He was with a company, and I'm going to go into this in a second, with, called Rena uh, back in the day. Um, today he's with Capital Logics, um, and I have to have met the CEO of Capital Logics uh, at my MTA event in April. A really interesting guy named Howard Getson, who I will definitely have on the show soon, because uh, uh, Howard and I shared some, uh, some commonalities that uh, I- I'm not going to go into here, but we definitely were on the same page. But uh, anyways, Dave, uh, thanks for joining today. I appreciate it. Mike, thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it. So let me let me just as a little bit of background. So when I first got started trying to figure things out, um, I, like a lot of people, was probably going through either Futures Magazine or technical analysis of stocks and commodities. And I would look through, and usually the most interesting thing were the small ads, not the broker ads, you know, the big whoever, the, you know, the FCM of the day or whoever, but the, the ads that were talking about something interesting. And, and there were so few people advertising anything about money management uh, that the one group that did at the time, Rena Systems out of Cincinnati, stood out. And I went ahead and I, I don't recall the exact year, early 90s. And right. I went out and uh, went to Cincinnati, my only trip to Cincinnati. And uh, so I do know that when you go to Cincinnati, you actually land at an airport in Kentucky. Um, (laughs) And so I went to Cincinnati and I actually was there for it was like two or three days, but actually sat there learning with Dave. And I know he doesn't remember me at the time, uh, but because there's a whole class full of people. But uh, that was that was really my first experience meeting you back then, way back in the day. Those were some, you know, three day seminars, basically me just talking, you know, about uh, lots of different subjects. But Things haven't really changed that much, but uh, you know, it, it, those were some interesting times with uh, the development of the software and uh, just trying to find new ways in which you can evaluate different trading systems. And really had a great time uh, learning just as much, you know, from from the people that I spoke to uh, at those seminars. You know, what it is that uh, you know their concerns were, what. Uh, you know, specifically the different types of systems that they were trading as well. So I got just as much out of those seminars as, uh, as I think everybody else did. So those were good times. Well, it was, it was the, I think for me, it was the, I was wrapping my arms around trend following, for example, and, but sitting down and seeing the, how you were going about the evaluation and how you were going about the testing process, uh, how things had been coded up with some of the software you guys had developed at Rena. That was a huge light bulb moment. And I think perhaps even the even bigger light bulb moment, and I know you can't name names, is there was probably no shortage of household names that were using Rena's products at the time. Well, there were certainly a lot. I mean, unfortunately at the time, you know, we were on the uh, the trade station platform and the Metastock platform and a few others that, not that we had our software working on those platforms, but there were just so many that just didn't go far enough in the way that they would go about evaluating their systems. You would see, you know, systems, you know, was it good based on percent profitable and, you know, did it make money? And a long time ago, I started saying, we got to slice and dice this thing many different ways so that we can get a really good idea as to what kind of a system we're dealing with, where the strengths, where the weaknesses, and then when it came to money management, you know, how can we exploit the uh, the strengths and, you know, avoid the weaknesses? So, uh, yeah, there were a lot of people that were actually using the program, um, and a lot of them were, you know, at banks, and I won't name names, but some were actually uh, high up people at banks that were actually using the software for themselves. But um, we had difficulty breaking into the uh, institutional side for the most part. 
But uh, we had a, a large number of people that were uh, just as interested as I was in understanding their their systems and trying to get a better feel for exactly what it is that they were attempting to trade. Well, let me let me set the predicate though for your your background. Let's let's go back in time, and I generally like to do this with most of my conversations and kind of give people a feel for the individual, and then we'll we'll work more towards some of your experience and achievements towards the the latter half. But let me. Let me. You grew up in Connecticut, mm-hmm. right. right? New Canaan, Connecticut. New New Canaan. You would I would not uh, not consider the same type of uh, atmosphere as a Greenwich or a Stanford. It was similar. There was um, between Greenwich and Upper Stanford. It was old money. Yeah, and then New Canaan is probably new money. Yeah, yeah. So so you. Like a lot of folks that I've talked to, you had, and I, I, I did it. I, you know, I, I did not have an early experience with any kind of trading, um, but you did at an early age. Why don't you tell me about that? Well, mine was actually fairly limited, um, but you know, I started off with, um, you know, my father having purchased, you know, hundred shares. Uh, there was a nine dollar stock. It was a Japan fund, and my goal was to you know to track it every single you know week. You know whenever the uh, the Sunday paper would come out, and I would plot it on paper. But a lot of my stuff. I mean, obviously this is way back when. That was sort of in the uh, mid '70s, '75, '76, '77 area, and I didn't know. You know, one, I was very very young, but uh, didn't know squat about uh, technical or or the fundamental stuff. But it was just the sort of the exposure to the um, investment arena. You know, you can actually make money by, you know, by buying these things. And it was a good time to uh, to have invested in that. So I got all, you know, excited by the fact that uh, I did absolutely nothing. And every week or just about every week, the thing would go up. So I uh, I got bit in the early stages uh, just by uh, by some of the things that my father would do. Now he's more of an investor, and I'm certainly more of a a trader. You know, he's more, and he still lives. Uh, he is uh, more of a uh, a stock guy, and uh, definitely more of a commodity person. But you know, in the early stages, that was uh, what got me interested in uh, in the investment side of things, and you know, did trade a few other stocks along the way, but. It wasn't really until college that uh, I started taking things a lot more seriously, and I just remember one day. I, I wish I could remember the uh, the friend of mine that uh, had uh, introduced me, but um, you know, I had the Investors Business Daily out there, and I uh, had the, the the Dow Jones out there, and he goes, "Oh, you're into technical," and I go. No, I don't even know what that is. And he goes, oh, let me show you. Shows me a couple of support and resistance lines. Shows me a trend line. All of a sudden, I go, wow. Now, this is cool. Because I had plotted things before, you know, with my old Apple IIe and VisiCalc and, um, you know, would plot uh, certain things myself. But I was just doing it just to sort of keep track of things. But uh, it, that was my moment, you know, being in the uh, the library and the guy kind of pointing that out to me. And that's... I guess back in 85 or so, and uh, then I started uh, trying to find as many books as I could, not even really knowing that it was called technical analysis. I just tried to find uh, different books when I could, and uh, slowly but surely kind of learn uh, through books and kind of similar to uh, some of the things that other people have done through uh, some of the magazine articles and um, talking with as many people as I possibly could. But... Most of the people back then were just uh, the fundamental. In fact, I think I still have an, an old book from, from college days that called Technical Analysis of Voodoo Technology. So, uh, you know, we, we've come a long way with, uh, with what we've been able to do. And so you, you, made that, you made that decision early on. You said, oh, you're like, you, it was almost a light bulb moment where you said, I can make my decisions for buying and selling off something unrelated to the fundamentals. Absolutely. And the, the curious thing is the reason I'm dyslexic. It's not severe dys- dyslexia, but I've got uh, dyslexia. <clears throat> and so what would happen for myself is that uh, I needed, like a term, robots to do certain things for me because I could design the things, I could set the, the, the stage for it. But um, I tried, I really did try to do a lot of things with uh, fundamental stuff, but it was too slow paced and couldn't gather the data. It didn't make sense to me. The technical stuff, all of a sudden, that's when it uh, really kind of um, 
hit for myself where I could actually probably turn this into some degree of an automated type process. Didn't know it would be considered a system at the time, but uh, it certainly was the thing that I gravitated towards uh, in the early stages. You know, talk, talk about that for a second, because you know you mentioned the dyslexia. Uh, how, how did did that? Do you really think that 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 played a a a pivotal moment in your life where that that actual that that somebody could say it as a disadvantage that disadvantage that you had at that moment actually turned into be an advantage because it allowed you to see things from a different light well two things you know i got no way to really say that this is true on the first point but i i think that i can look at data and i kind of design systems in my head so um I think the dyslexia, not because, you know, you reverse numbers, things of that nature, but because I knew that because I do have a propensity to to rearrange numbers on occasion, that you have to be smart. You have to really kind of sit there and say to yourself, if I'm going to be able to do certain things, I'm going to have to automate it. Um, and so it forced me, I think, the dyslexia, as it, I think it happens for a lot of people with dyslexia, you find ways around, you know, and find your own solutions. And so from, from my side, I couldn't just sit there and do it from a discretionary point and then say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and buy this. What I had to do uh, throughout the years was to learn specifically how to uh, uh, kind of go through the steps of having the whole thing automated from from start to finish, you know, specifically on the uh, the execution side. And uh, I think that the, it forced me to learn how to look at things perhaps a little bit differently. So I think that's the, the main point that the dyslexia really helped me to, uh, to go about doing it. And I think sometimes that I just simply look at things a little bit differently from other people that uh, I can see an unusual indicator and say, oh, I, I think I can do something with that. While some people would say, it doesn't make sense whatsoever. So uh, it could just be a byproduct of having design systems for so long you start thinking in those terms. But the, the dyslexia, I view as a an advantage, at least from my side, because it forced me to find a solution that I probably would never have gone through in the early stages. Let me... I don't want to. I didn't want to jump ahead here, but I think it's important to lay the foundation because we. We. I know your world is 100% systematic. That's how you approach things. So mm-hmm. you, you come up with the trading idea, uh, you you code it, you test it, and then perhaps you apply it if it works. But right. w- what I would like is for you to put Professor Stendhal cap on and explain to me, from your perspective, uh, explain to me the audience what is a system. System in its raw form is just something that is, it, it looks at, in my peer case, from a technical perspective, open, high, low, closed data related to some indicator. And that indicator is going to do something. And you're going to have it go through a particular process when it triggers and that condition is equal to true, uh, as an example, because everyone uses it. A slow moving average crosses above, uh, you know, a faster uh, moving average, uh, or the reverse. That's a condition that has just initiated itself. That in itself is a buy signal. So you allow yourself to say, fine, that's my entry signal. So you either go longer to go short, and then you have the reciprocal system here, you know, the indicator that does the complete opposite, or you have some other type of indicator or some other type of condition that looks to liquidate the position. In raw form, what you have is a legitimate, not quasi, not pseudo, a 100% situation that you can test that condition every single time, look at it historically, and that condition, when it occurs, you enter in your position. XYZ takes place, you end up liquidating the position. That's you know, essentially what a system is. It's, it's just simply math, open, high, low, close, indicators that when they run their course and they do whatever it is that uh, you want it to do, they uh, will enter and exit a position. Pretty straightforward. All right, but are you, it's straightforward to you because you've been doing this for 25 plus years. So, but to the average person out there, even perhaps when I say the average person, it could be the average retail guy. It could be some high level, high net worth guy. It could be a guy that's running a pension. Some of what you just described is fairly simple and straightforward though. It sometimes doesn't resonate. There's, I mean, you, you immediately said, I, I got it. I saw the light bulb moment. 
<laughs> How do you some is there is there is there are there other ways that you will explain what you just explained to get people over the hump? Well, I mean, in order to design a system, you have to really understand what it is you're looking at. It forces you to quantify what you're looking for. And I've, I've spoken to I don't know how many people. They say, well, I'm, I'm systematic. What's your system? Let's go ahead and try to code this thing. Well, I do it this way, I do it this way. Well, now it's changing. Is it this way or is it that way? And what it does is it really forces you to truly understand what it is that you're attempting to do. And the, the end result of it is that you're going to end up with a mathematical formula, something you can actually test. So it's well worth the time and effort to go through that for your process. So I explain it you know, to, to the lay public in that everyone, when they make a decision to buy, they are the system. They eventually come up with some reason why they've chosen to liquidate. Hopefully it's based on something you can program and not some analyst on TV that said XYZ so you liquidated. But if it's something that you're looking at a screen on, it can be programmed. And I've had tons of people say, well, you can't program me. Well, because you're not systematic. You know, you're more discretionary in your, your approach to things, and you're not really taking the time to, to sit down and list out what is causing you to, to buy and to sell. So, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, everyone is a system. It's just a matter of getting rid of the, a lot of the garbage, getting rid of a lot of the redundancy to what they're, they're looking at, and boiling it down to its raw essence. And, you know, some of these people have super complex systems, multiple indicators, and you can very easily get rid of this one. RSI and percent are virtually the same thing. Why do you have both in there? I don't know. Well, let's get rid of one. And you can really boil it down and, and uh, boil it down to something that's relatively simple. And I found, as I'm sure you have, that the, the simpler systems are the ones that have the fewest moving parts, and the fewest moving parts typically are the systems that they're not foolproof, but they happen to, in my opinion, be some of the more secure systems over the long term. So but, from, from that standpoint, go ahead. What I was going to say, you, you could almost make a car analogy there where it's like you think back to the, to the 1950s, style Chevy cars and you know you, you lift up the uh, you know lift up the hood you can see everything it's kind of like big picture nuts and bolts you kind of know where all the problems are there's there's less moving parts now you can drive a Lexus I, I occasionally do and there's never been a problem but there's a heck of a lot more parts going on there exactly and it's not something you're gonna fix in your own garage you're gonna need um uh all the electronics to uh, to figure out and sort of diagnose where the problem is, and I mean, they I've got a Lexus and they they do run nice and uh, I've got no complaints, but it's not something that I'm going to be able to work on. When it comes down to systems, I want to make sure that, in general terms, I should be able to explain that system on the back of a cocktail nap napkin, and if I can't do that then there's probably some redundancy in the system, so it's probably time to, to simplify it. The object is, yes, they're simple systems. You just simply have a lot of them and a lot of different markets, and you solve certain problems not in the system, not in the money management. You solve it you know, in the diversification of all the different markets, and I think sometimes people look at a system and they say it's not working. Well, it probably is working. It's designed for a certain type of condition. Nothing is foolproof, and you just simply have to find a different type of condition or different type of a system for another environment, and then you just simply mix and match and you know put them together over time. Yeah, I, I hope people are really paying attention because I, I not only are we talking about systems, but I can see the way that you think and how you approach it, and it's systematic. You're, I mean, you're you're getting people the way you're talking about this. You're 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 just presenting it in a very straightforward manner, and that people can either listen to your words, and and, and follow along and take the wisdom, or frankly, it, they're going to spend a lot of time getting back to the ultimate lessons that you're trying to pass along right now. Because I I had a guy email me the other day, and he was talking about uh, a trend following system, and he immediately starts talking about all these discretionary things that he wants to do. 
And I said, mm-hmm. well, I said, well, what about making that systematic? Well, you can't make it systematic. It's discretion. I, I, I and I was like, well, what, what was there some secret sauce that only you are going to know at the exact moment when something happens on the screen and you, you can't write this down. You can't quantify it in any way. And I think that's kind of the attitude you're getting towards was like, if you, if you could talk it, you got to be able to quantify it. Cause if you can't quantify it, maybe it's not really there. Exactly. Um, I've known a number of people, and, and you say, fine, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to spend the time, and I'm going to quantify you. you. You talk to talk, let's go ahead and put you down on a list. And then what ended up happening, uh, we found this out very quickly, we've got a top-notch programmer, so we, uh, we, we quickly started taking a look at what the, the guy was saying, and he goes, well, you're not programming it right. Really? Well, you know, this is where you told us it should, should trigger. Well, you need this in there. Okay, so now we've got one other module we've got to put in there, and then there's another and another. Well, what turns this module on and which turns this one off? And then you quickly find out you're full of crap, you know, that it's totally discretion. And you end up saying that, um, you, you want to be the, the guy that's out there and says, look, I would have done this. Yeah. You would have done that, you know, into the future system people. We have to develop the thing. We have to then be able to go back in time without curve fitting or any manipulation, at least the honest ones. Uh, what we need to do is be able to sort of quantify this thing. And it's, at least in this one gentleman's case, you know, did the discretionary person was saying, well, you're just not programming it right. Well, it's because you haven't really thought it all the way through. And if you take the time to understand what it is that you're doing and why it is that you felt compelled to have to discretionarily make this adjustment or that adjustment, that uh, you might become a little more efficient and uh, obviously somewhat profitable in that for your case. But, you know, it takes all kinds. That's why I like systems because um, you peel away, you know, the layers, you know what you're dealing with. And if you can legitimately design robust systems and accept, you know, the, uh, the strengths and weaknesses of those systems, combine them with other ones, then life becomes much easier. And with just a few people, you can manage a lot of money as opposed to having to have uh, a ton of discretionary treasures do certain things. That's where the systematic people have the advantage. It's really just a matter of just taking the time, having the patience and the wherewithal to actually develop those types of systems. That's all the upfront work. But once you have them, and trading going forward, in my opinion, is pretty easy. Now, your systems these days and even in the past, uh, you're but a price action guy. Is that right? Exactly. So I have a question for you to kind of slightly put you on the spot. Uh, so the the biggest, baddest hedge fund manager on the block, managing who knows how many billions, I think he's north of 100 billion these days, is is Bridgewater, Ray Dalio. And, and uh, I don't know much about what he does. He's got an interesting uh, kind of philosophical manifesto online. But I'm curious your perspective, because I sometimes theorize what some of these big – your big folks are doing that are managing such massive amounts of money. But he says openly he is uh, 100% systematic, but doesn't use any technical information, which I, 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 I now you've been a guy that's been doing this for a long time. I'm sure you've tested everything under the sun. I mean, I, I want the audience to understand that of all the folks that I've had, I know I've had a lot of folks running significant money and whatnot, but I know Dave has lived and breathed testing for decades. So, uh, you know, I know right there with guys like Bob Pardo, you, you guys have this is this is your specialty. So when you hear someone say, though, that they're running a 100 percent systematic approach, but not using technical information, how does that initially strike your gut? Well, I guess uh, I might be old school. I guess uh, I would say that I'd be surprised by that, um, but it would be something that I would be intrigued by. Um, you know, I choose to take people at their word. Uh, I have done things kind of in the same fashion for quite some time, so I am certainly within my own little bubble, if you will. Um, but yeah, you know, there are some very smart people out there. You just like you just like have, you just like I put you on the spot with the biggest guy on the planet, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry. So I, there's no doubt that I'm sure that he's he's got something there. But uh, uh, if if I were coming in the door, I would be looking at it. From my perspective, which uh, I've had certain people call it old school type trading, trend oriented momentum and pattern, and you know relatively simple things, but there are some smart kids out there and and smart uh, people that you know have got some. You why know, do you, why, do you ex- why do you explain it though from the standpoint? Because we're talking about moving parts, 
And price action, you know, it's reducing all the, because you know, if Ray Dalio says he's looking at all these fundamental perspectives for all these different markets, 100 plus markets that he's trading. So he has to code a system that's taking into account all these different fundamental inputs. We're not talking about a small number of fundamental inputs, okay? I mean, because the moment you say you're going to be trading on fundamentals and you're going to make it <laughs> systematic, there's a lot of things going into that stew. I mean, there's a lot of inputs. Right. Now, over here on the Dave Stendhal side of the world, perhaps my side of the world, you got that one major input. So if you're thinking this through, though, explain the difference, perhaps, even though I'm not really asking you to talk about Dalio, but the idea of making price action systematic versus taking in a massive number of fundamentals systematic and perhaps, like I said, even though I'm putting you on the spot, kind of explain to the audience how different those two concepts are. Well, they're very different uh, from from my perspective. Um, I took the easier route, I think, with uh, with technical, where you're you're looking at very few moving parts coming into it. Uh, as I mentioned, open, high, low, close, volume, open interest. You know, massaging it with different types of indicators and watching them go up and down, overbought, oversold, presto magic. You've got uh, enough ingredients in your stew to be able to develop a system. The reason that, uh, and I did honestly in the early 90s try to, to do certain things with the fundamentals, and <clears throat> what I would do is I would gather as much information as I could, bring that into Excel and try to organize it. Uh, the problem was that uh, the numbers were always changing, uh, the data was slow, uh, it was uh, something that I think would give a good current to where the mark was going. And I would say it helps to cock the gun with it, but you pull the trigger on the, the technical side. But if you were to be able to have pseudo real-time data uh, or very real-time data and a lot of it and have all of that information come in and organized uh, the, uh, the inputs and the amount of uh, information that's coming into that type of a system, in my mind, is going to be much more complex by obvious reason. And you also run the, the risk of... Um, how much weighting you give to each of those variables, and you could theoretically end up with, um, you know, a garbage meal because you may have optimized or cursed it or overweighted certain elements to it. So I always chose to take what I think is the the easier route, but be uh, very painstaking in the way you go about uh, designing it. So one can be very complex, and the other one, you know, in its raw form, can be very simple, in my opinion. But let me let me just because I, I think there's a little bit of self deprecation there. Can you say the easiest route is the easiest route in the sense of perhaps you're you're developing the system, coding the system, etc. But I wouldn't call it less sophisticated because I think the idea of being less is more. Is a, sophist is a sophisticated style of thinking, even though to perhaps the outside masses, they might say, oh, that's just simple. It, 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 but the philosophy behind it is not simple. Absolutely. I mean, I, I've developed some very simple systems and presented it to some you know, very smart math, mathematicians, PhDs, and they looked at it and they said, too simple would never work. Well, it doesn't have to be complex. You know, sometimes... Fewer moving points, uh, parts, as we said, is better, you know. And so from, from that perspective, um, it's a matter of testing so many different things to find out what actually does work. But when you actually look at it and you peel away the, the, the layers and you really look at the code, you know, it's, it's maybe four lines of code, but how much time and effort went into figuring out those four lines of code, that uh, the complexity is there. And then if you really think about it, you know, um, Open, high, low, closed data massaged one way or the other. In my opinion, you know that's you know the major thing that you should be looking at. Maybe not everything, but if you give me different types of data sets, first thing I'm going to be looking for is open, high, low, closed data. I mean that is the market, that is supply and demand, that is the raw juice that goes into the system, and that's obviously what you're going to be looking at. So you might as well, in my opinion, look at that. That is your your starting point, and sometimes you don't have to go much further beyond that. You know, so we've been talking about systems and your ideas behind them and kind of your philosophical foundation. But once, and we're not going to go, we're not going to have the time today to go into uh, any kind of uh, a lot of specifics necessarily. But once you have a system with a positive edge, positive expectation, the, the mm -hmm. next thing that I want to lead into to let you put your pro professorial hat on the, 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 the professor 
Stendhal, is, is to say, what is money management? Because a lot of people can hear that term and those two words combined to different people on Wall Street could possibly mean different things. I think to you and I, with our backgrounds, we hear the phrase money management in it's position sizing. You know, you have we all have limited capital. So how much are you going to bet? Why don't I let you take it from the top though? I'm just your I'm just the guy sitting in the front of the classroom going, you know, Professor Sindal, I don't know what I'm doing right here. Please, what the heck is position sizing? What is money management? Please tell me. Well, in it as you said, in kind of in this raw form, it it um to me it tells you how many shares, how many contracts to trade in a particular environment. Uh you can have um you know, money management, which I think is more of a misnomer. And I, like yourself, I like uh, position sizing better. And there are a gazillion different ones. I mean, in the the program that Rena just uh, incorporated into to TradeStation, I think they've got 15 different types of position sizing algorithms that you can apply. Um, but essentially, you know, in its raw form, it it looks at where you are, how much risk do you have, how much money do you have, and through numeric form, it tells you how many contracts or how many shares you should be trading. It's just as important and sometimes even more important than the system itself so that you don't find yourself um, over-trading something or betting too, too much. It's slowly, methodically applying what I think is the right position sizing algorithm to the, the correct system. And from, from that angle, you can have different position sizing algorithms. Uh, you can have um, something like a max favorable excursion, which looks at the individual system and tells you when to add to your position and perhaps how much to add to it. You can have a more traditional average to range with an average to range uh, uh, ATR type uh, you know, formula that tells you how many shares to, or how many contracts to trade. It's really the thing that binds the system together, especially if you have multiple systems, so that uh, what ends up happening is that, as we know, greed and fear, you, know, you all start, you know, start thinking, wow, I've solved it, I'm a genius, I've mastered the market, mastered the universe, and that's when you start overcompensating and start putting more, more trades out there, and sure enough, that's when the, the drawdown is going to occur. And what these, from my perspective, what the, uh, these money management tools do for us is, uh, just like a system, it helps to sort of curtail your emotions and specifically spits out a number. You will buy four contracts. You will buy, you know, eight contracts. You will buy, you know, a thousand shares, you know, a thousand point two shares. But, you know, whatever the case is, you're going to have a scenario where the, the position sizing tool will tell you exactly how many shares to, to trade. And it's uh, much more efficient to do it that way uh, once you've uh, you've got the systems in place. Would you concur that almost any position sizing algorithm that could be developed or put in place also has within it a, a thermostat like ability to uh, either pull your risk back or pull your risk up? It should. I mean, um, you know, there are aggressive tools like Optimal Left from Ralph Vince. Uh, we came up at Reno with something called Secure F, which was essentially the same formula, but if you're trying to uh, minimize your exposure at a certain time. It's kind of a more conservative Optimal F. But yeah, there you can have aggressive, you can have conservative, and then once you have that tool on there, you can make it more or less aggressive. But the great thing about that, as you were saying, is that it protects itself so that when you do eventually have some type of a drawdown, it reassesses things and looks at how much capital you have so that you're not compelled to say, well, i got to get back to where I was, and therefore I'm going to have to uh, triple my position size because I need to get back where I was. The, the, the position sizing methodically will go through and make sure that you hopefully don't make too much money and you don't give back too much money. And it's what I would term, if you looked at an equity curve, a smoother ride because of it. Yeah. I think, you know, the, the, in, we don't necessarily need to go into today. I know in the past you have run a CTA for, for uh, many, many years, and you, you talked about one of the, the, the issues in running your CTA was dealing with clients. It's one thing to have successful systems, uh, to have this great infrastructure in place, have good staff, good leadership, etc. But if you have clients that don't necessarily understand what all that 
is put together to do, then those clients can be nervous Nellies. They can they can pull out at the wrong time. They they can right. they could they could just be a pain in the butt to work with. And I guess the reason I bring that up is it is that when you look at some of the the longstanding CTAs that have really had uh, the many many decades, I think one of the advantages they have built in is that clients got started so early with them that they they've kind of gone through the cycles the different cycles and they've seen what happens with this position sizing algorithm. And so mm-hmm. they they know they kind of seen this process happen and they're comfortable with it. Whereas I think maybe maybe this is part of your experience with with newer firms and uh, these clients today that all want to imagine that there's these low volatility, uh, no risk approaches to trading. They sometimes don't right. have the patience. They don't, and and I, I, easier said than done. I'm big into education. I'm big into explaining things as best as I can. And you know, I've developed tools that try to kind of show where are we now. And if you're making too much money, hey, great, you know, happy, happy. No, don't worry. You know, we're initially we're going to have some form of a drawdown. This is what the drawdown typically looks like. This is what a two-fold or two-and-a-half-fold drawdown looks like. And you're you're contrarian. You're always throwing water when things are going well, and you're always trying to to boost them up when it when it's low. And so, you know, you end up developing a lot of indicators specifically for the investors. Uh, the markets are quiet right now, and so here's a tool. So one of the first things that we would do is we would introduce uh, this trend level indicator that looks at all the different markets, and we would immediately, you know, while we're trying to to get the investors to come on board not just simply sell them on the product, but sell them on who we were, what we did, and what tools are you going to be looking at so that when we're in a slow period, we're trend-oriented. It's not a surprise that we're not making money. It's like you're a sailboat and there's no wind. How am I going to make money if I don't have any wind? Well, I should have more systems in the mixture, but if you're primarily a trend-oriented uh, trader, no wind, you're not going to be able to make money. In fact, you might even, you know, well, behold, lose some money. And so what ends up happening is you start showing them additional tools. If they're willing to learn, if they want, then you start showing them these different types of indicators uh, that are specifically designed for them so that when things are quiet and you're not making money, maybe that's a good time to make an investment, an additional investment. And when things get super hot and you think that you're for geniuses and, you know, now you're thinking about adding to your position, you know, and adding more, you know, that would be great. However, look at the trend level. Look where it is. Is that something that you actually want to be getting into right now? Why don't you allow me to tell you, you know, based upon this indicator and show this indicator to you, you know, and update this information every single day so that you become um, sort of aware of your surroundings. And you, I wouldn't say you dumb it down, but you bring it down to a number and you show them what that number represents so that they can appreciate, um, the, one, the education love you're giving to them and also trying to save them some money so they don't get, you know, at the wrong time and at the same time take advantage of you know, when, when the markets are actually down and uh, it's a good time to add to your investments. That's, I think, you know, what, you, what CTAs in general should be doing. Um, I think they spend too much time in certain cases just trying to sell them, and then they send them their, their monthly uh, updates and their little newsletter. But I think by educating them so that they understand, based upon the markets that you trade, you know, here are some educational tools that you can use so that uh, your investors are in a better position going forward. Well, let me let me uh, let me bounce around on you a little bit. Let me let me throw you up to current today, right now. As I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, I had the good fortune. You know, I gave this presentation at the Market Technicians Association um, in April, I believe it was April, and uh, a lot of people had never heard of trend following. Jeff Lay, who had had me there, he had heard of it, but a lot of people had not. And uh, I had a good fortune to meet somebody who you work with, I think on a daily basis now, Howard Getson at Capital Logics. And we were just kind of commenting how few people, it seemed to be this, a lot of old school mentalities to technical approaches. Whereas I kind of look at it like, believe you do, which is make it systematic, price is the best variable to use, 
And, you know, all the stuff that we all kind of grew up about reading in Futures Magazine or technical analysis, you know, these funky approaches and just just not relevant. But so the longer question, what are you guys up to at Capital Logics? What, what, is, what, is, what are you up to today? Well, I'll say this, that, you know, uh, I've known Howard for probably about 15 years or so. And uh, I started with Howard probably about a year, year and a half technically ago. And a great team of, of young programmers. I, find, I feel like a kid in a candy store because I now have access to a lot of really smart people who can implement a lot of things that I've been attempting to do for, for many years. So literally, we are looking at thousands of systems and combining them together. Uh, we're, we're doing just about anything and everything you can think of, you know, behind the scenes. We're, we're looking at seasonals. We're looking at turning systems on and off through correlation. We've got momentum. We've got pattern. We've got trend-based. Uh, we have a slew of markets that we can be looking at intraday, end of day. And to take all of that information from, from my perspective, you know, in the past, that was a lot of information to be able to update, manage, and to be able to apply. And what we're doing now is developing a lot of very interesting software, something that we've never seen before because, you know, we're doing it for our own purposes, and finding ways in which we can have multiple layers to, you know, a system, the system on top of risk management, money management, portfolio allocation, combining these things into baskets and having different weightings with different baskets. So when you say, what are we up to? We're up to a lot. And it's one of these things that uh, uh, with the developers that we have, um, you know, things never move fast enough. You know, for, for my purposes, I always want it yesterday. But we're, we're in a position now that uh, we've, we have already created a number of things which is allowing us to trade. And uh, if we can just continue at this particular pace, uh, I'd say that uh, certainly by the end of this year, we'll have more and more levels to our trading. And we're certainly not running out of ideas uh, between Howard and myself. I think we have uh, enough ideas that would keep us running for the next 20 years or so. So uh, it's, it's fun. Um, trading is fun again because you can test so many different things, and we can do them efficiently. Uh, and it's just a matter of uh, putting these things, these ideas, these concepts into baskets and then figuring out systematically when those baskets should come on board and mixing and matching them and having all of this information at my fingertips and continuing to grow the software to be able to uh, hopefully eventually be able to do this for the public as well, uh, where it's not just being developed for ourselves, but it's uh, being developed for high net worth individuals and or, you know, uh, large institutional firms that hopefully they'll appreciate what it is that we're creating and we'll, uh, we'll do it both on the software side as well as on the trading side. So it's uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of fun things. And I haven't been able to say that for, uh, you know, you know the, over the last, say, three years or so. I haven't been able to say that, but I'm genuinely having a great deal of fun with, uh, with Capital Logics and the things that we're developing. Well, you know, my, my, my trend-following acolytes are, are probably sitting back going, I don't understand, Mike. I don't, I don't get it. I mean, clearly, you're not writing about the things that Dave just said there and, you know, da-da-da-da-da. And I said, well, hold on. Actually, I am, okay? I mean, from my perspective, I think for the individual out there or perhaps even the individual investor right now with the opportunities that present themselves, long-term trend-following still presents a great classic fantastic way to participate when there's chaos out there and when you all kind of have that gut level feel of like oh gosh we know the black swan's going to swim in again but where when how how can i be prepared to take advantage and classic trend following is just one of your best options however if if you think about it if somebody has the ambition the time and whatnot and they want to take things and carve things up systematically and look at it from multiple approaches I think the mentality, the scientific mentality, has more in common with the systematic trend following than not in common. And I think Absolutely. you should, I, I th- I, I, you're going to agree with me on that, but I wanted to add one thing quick, too, and I'll let you discuss this, too. But for the naysayers out there, well, Mike, this sounds like just the second coming of long-term capital management. That's the part I want you to kind of address. All right. Well, um, one, 
the core, what I always term as the backbone to any portfolio, specifically within our firm, it is trend-oriented. And then what we do is there are, there are periods where it's going to be slow to turn. And so what we do is we simply look at a wide variety of other styles that help to buff out the rough edges and be able to, to develop something that is uh, sound by itself, incorporated into a trend base, so you end up getting a, a nice smooth equity curve. The, the nice thing about what we do, if you really bring it down to the minutia, back to what we started with, what is a system? system tells you when to buy system tells you exactly when to sell. We haven't talked about risk management, but that obviously comes into play. That tells you specifically when to liquidate a position. And for every reason you get in, typically our systems will have two, possibly three reasons to liquidate. And so if you really take it down to the minutia and then take that system with risk management applied to it, and then you start building up these portfolios, and you use appropriate money management where you're not out there for the greed factor, you're out there for as stable a ride as you possibly can with a nice return. Nice return being 10, 15%, not 150% with a, a good opportunity to, uh, to go belly up you know, in a week's time and not over leveraging yourself and diversifying your, yourself across a lot of non-correlated type markets that's substantially different from long-term capital. Um, and so from, from that angle, uh, being able to develop all of those tools and all of those layers, that's what Capital Logics is actually doing. And we bring it down to the minutia and then build it up into the big portfolio, evaluating each and every step along the way. That's something that a lot of software packages just can't do, at least not all the way through. And that's what we're trying to develop in ourselves. Let me let me just to be fair, too, because I know it's kind of a kind of a scarlet letter when you hear this phrase, long term capital management, LTCM. And just for some background for people that don't know, uh, LTCM, I believe. I think you could trace much of the moral hazards created today to the bailing out of this hedge fund in the summer of 1998. But why do I let you, so you can, you, I'll let you put your prof, your professor hat on. Um, why don't you explain to the audience a little bit about LTCM from your perspective? Because I know your background, you wrote an options newsletter way back in the day, and you've had some experience with options. Why don't you kind of like outline for people just so they see that clear distinction? Because I a little bit unfairly brought it up, but I wasn't trying to make a, a comparison. I was kind of more the, the critic out there that, that might just throw something out. But why don't you kind of uh, draw a line around what happened in the summer of 1998? Well, in general terms, um, you had some very smart people that um, – were attempting to hedge themselves and protect themselves and come up with uh, something that was going to be as stable as possible. And I think in, in its raw form, it just simply got away from them and things got more and more and more uh, risky. And that black swan scenario, if memory serves, it was, uh, you know, Russia and defaults and they weren't anticipating certain things, uh, figuring that they were hedged with very sophisticated models. And unfortunately, things imploded, and you know, for obvious reasons, they were uh, not obvious, but for uh, reasons, uh, they were bailed out. And I think that sometimes, and I don't know the inner workings, I don't know anybody that worked there, but I think that sometimes what can happen is that um, you can, you can, again, getting back to what I said before, if you can't explain it on in the back of a napkin as to what your system is and how it then relates to others, and you make things very, very complicated, sometimes what can happen is that uh, the sophisticated nature of what you're trying to do can, can get the better of you. And I think that for, uh, for the most part that with long-term capital, with uh, you know, the people that they had, uh, very, very smart people, uh, I think that things probably got a little ahead of themselves. They they ended up taking on uh, a fair amount of risk, and that black swan scenario, uh, which maybe some people saw, I certainly didn't see it coming. Uh, but uh, when when these conditions do arrive, you could best find yourself in a position that if that should happen, am I over leveraged? 
hopefully the money management would help to curtail part of that so you don't have a huge risk to ruin an opportunity to go out of business overnight, that you're diversified across a number of different types of markets, a variety of different trading styles, the ability to go long and short, but you're not just hedging yourself for the sake of hedging. You're hedging yourself because the conditions in the market uh, suggested that you go short the market, not because you were too long, but because conditions really turned on, on the short side. So by having all of those things in place, uh, I think that you're in a, a better position. And don't get me wrong, I mean, there are going to be ups and downs no matter who's actually doing the trading. I've had periods in my past CTA firms where we've had uh, numerous down months in a row. There is, no, there is no perfect scenario, but the difference is what you don't want to have happen is put yourself in a position that you take on too much risk and your risk controls are too wide and that that black swan scenario can come back to bite you, and that's essentially what happened with long-term capital. Yeah, that's a great explanation. I, I hope people really follow that because I – and once again, I, I've seen this throughout our whole conversation. Is you, not, not only are you somebody who lives and breathes systems, I think you – through the way your tone and the way that you are describing this, you can you can really follow the 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 loop process. There's a loop going on in Dave Stendhal's mind, and you can just see it, you know. And I think that's it's it's really important for people to realize that this is about process. It's about process, and you ha you have to you have to develop these approaches and and test them and 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 really look at the guts of things and. You know, I'm sure you have tested infinite data series that have similar moves to what mm -hmm. we saw in the summer of 1998. And you probably didn't even have to know what the narrative was going on in the real world. You could see these very quick, sudden, abrupt moves, the swan swimming in. But those are data points that are in your data series that you have to deal with on any system that you have to develop. I mean, you're because uh, if the system can't handle that, then it doesn't pass the mustard. Is that a fair set? Well, and exactly. So when you when you look at, you know, all the different data points and you really start looking at the, the markets in um, smaller time frames, larger time frames, you have to take into account what is going on with these uh, abrupt moves. And if your systems can't handle that, they can't, uh, they don't have the right stop logic, uh, they're too heavily influenced by those types of conditions, you're going to see it when you start to evaluate your systems. So, you know, when you, when you look at the kind of deep that we look at with our systems, um, we're not selling systems. I'm not selling systems. What I'm selling is money management, you know, and the CTA and things of that nature. So you, I'm not interested in bringing optimized or curve fit systems into the mixture. So obviously what I have to do is I have to look at virtually every type of condition that's out there and ask myself and, and validate and mathematically, uh, you know, evaluate the systems. Do they trade poorly during those times, or do they trade the way that they're supposed to? Of course, you know, the long systems are probably going to get hit. Do they get hit really hard, or is it something that is um, normal? And do I have other tools, you know, other, you know, other systems in my bag of tricks that would allow me the opportunity to have something that uh, would help to uh, uh, protect myself during that time frame? So, when it comes down to it, when, not if, when those conditions pop up again, uh, Hopefully the, the stop loss logic will help to uh, to protect, and uh, hopefully the the systems on the short side will you know hopefully be able to find themselves in a position to take advantage of it, give me a little uh, uh, hedging. Uh, hopefully the the diversification through some other markets. Uh, I do an awful lot with uh, correlation studies um, that hopefully would find myself in a position that I can avoid trading at certain times. So all those things come together. Um, you find yourself in, in, the, in the light that you might have a better shot. There's never, ever going to be a scenario that it's going to be perfect, but uh, at least you're, you're more protected than, than a person that's ultra-aggressive and, and throws caution to win in that kind of a scenario. Yeah. Well, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to – I know I can't keep you all day, but I think I'm going to let you uh, – let that be the best sound piece of advice. I think it's a, a great hour of kind of really walking people through the systematic mindset – Dave, where is the if people want to reach out to you? I know you're big on Twitter, um, so you're usually found there. But where, where else can people reach out to you and find out more about you and your your current work today? 
Uh, the best place would uh, be at uh, the website, which is capitallogics.com. Or you can, as uh, you just said, you can uh, track me. I do an awful lot on Twitter, putting out a lot of information uh, during the course of the day. So uh, you can find me on Twitter at David underscore Stendhal, S-T-E-N-D-A-H-L. And you can, you can track me that way. Very accessible. So if, uh, if you all have questions, I like to talk, as you can tell. Listen, great stuff, Dave. Also, check out Dave's books on Amazon. And uh, hopefully we will talk again in the future, Dave. I appreciate your time today. Great. Thanks so much. I appreciate the time. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.